Hello, it's Gabby here for you. Before we jump onto this week's podcast, I just want to let you know about two ways that you can work with me. First of all, I do one-to-one coaching and I do that via Zoom so we can jump on a Zoom call at a time to suit you. The second thing I've got for you is an online coaching course that's 12 modules that you can download straight away now. There will be a link somewhere around these podcast notes. And this is the course that I've designed and it's got everything in it that I wish I'd have known when I finished cancer treatment and I was lost. So you can download that course now and you can start working towards making this your happiest and healthiest year ever. I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what you think. Take care. Bye bye. Hello there, it's Gabby here from Confidence After Cancer and I hope this finds you well. In this week's podcast, I'm speaking to a really interesting guest. His name is Rick, I hope I say his surname correctly, Chapelsky. Um, He's from America, he's got a very interesting story to share with us. He's an author, he is now a motivational speaker uh, where he shares his story of how he is a two times cancer survivor but not just the story of his illness and his diagnosis and what he went through at such a young age, but also he talks a lot about survivorship and what you can do to create the life that you love after cancer treatment has ended. How do you rebuild your life and how do you get back on board when when the rest of the world seems to have moved on, but you're in a very different place from when you started your cancer treatment? Rick's got some really inspiring and motivational words for us as he shares his story which is quite a shocking story to hear but he shares it with warm with good humor and he's very generous now in sharing what he has learned to help other people so let's go over and meet Rick now and I hope you enjoy this podcast as much as I enjoyed recording it Okay, so my guest this week, and I'm speaking to somebody across the water for the magic of technology we've got here. Uh, I'm Gabby from Confidence After Cancer, and I'm in Manchester in the UK. And I'm re- speaking to Rick, and I have to be really careful how I say your surname. So Rick <laughs> Ch- Chaplesky, is that right? Yeah, you got it. Rick, Rick Chaplesky, you got it. <laughs> oh, got there in the end. <laughs> and Rick's in <laughs> Milwaukee. And we've connected on Instagram, for the, again, through the magic of social media. We've connected, we've got... Some of our journeys is quite similar in, you know, I'm in confidence after cancer. I'm all about the journey after treatment finishes and the struggles that I had sharing my story because I think it might help somebody else. And I think that's something that kind of resonates with Rick as well from speaking to him. Mm-hmm. So I'd love Rick, if you can just take us through your story. I mean, I know a little bit about it, but it's quite a, an incredible story because you're so young, weren't you, when you were diagnosed? Yeah, I was diagnosed in my late teens and what happened was I was a university student and my university was in a very cold part of um, the United States, very North. And like many university students, I would go to parties and do the drinking and, and dancing or whatever. And it was mm-hmm. fun. And what I realized over time was I, as things got colder, I'd wear a large jacket and my jacket started to smell like smoke. So when I would come back to my dorm room, that jacket would like stink up the whole thing. And I didn't like wearing it to class during the week. So I started going to these parties and I left my jacket behind. So the weather started to get, you know, around zero degrees um, Celsius. And I was walking around with no jacket on. Well, anyway, towards the end of the semester, I got really sick and I started to have swollen lymph nodes in my neck. So over the winter break, my mother took me into the doctor who said, well, you have mono. So for the rest of the winter break, I sat back, drank a lot of fluids and tried to heal from that. And eventually Mm -hmm. I returned to college. Eight weeks later, I returned back to my parents' home for spring break. I still had the swollen lymph nodes. My mom, she kind of put her hand on my neck like this. And she said, we're getting you into the doctor right now. And within an hour, I was in my pediatrician's office. I was 19. And he got a second opinion while I was there. They both these doctors examined me and they said, well, you need a biopsy. And mm-hmm. I said, well, I didn't, I didn't even know what a biopsy was. Mm-hmm. So the next day I went in for the biopsy of my neck. I lied on the table. They cut some pieces out. And as a 19 year old, I thought, well, this is really cool. It's just a, <laughs> a procedure. I had no idea why I would even get this. Yeah. 
So I returned to school once spring break was done and I had a big bandage on my neck and people were saying, what is, what did you get that from? And I said, oh, I had a biopsy. And they were like, wow, that's cool. And nobody knew what this was. Yeah. So a few days later, it was just a Tuesday night. My parents knocked on my door and I opened the door. I, I was not expecting them to come. They, they made a four hour drive to see me. Their glasses were fogged over. They had tears in their eyes. And they said, you have Hodgkin's disease. And I had no idea what that was. So like every normal 19 year old with Hodgkin's disease, I did what you would expect. And I kicked them out. I said, you guys got to get out of here. <laughs> so I, I sent them back. I sent them back on the road after this. Yeah. Bring so I tried to read. Sorry? I said, bring that bad news to you. That's not, that's not good, is it? No. <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's yeah. comical. Oh, but that's what happened. And yeah. so I didn't really know what the disease was. I, I went to the library with a friend and we tried to research it. And we couldn't find anything. So I left school for about a week and got all sorts of blood tests and scans and all that. And I was diagnosed with stage 2B Hodgkin's disease in my neck and then in my chest. Now, the good news was this could be treated with radiation. Okay. And there was a hospital directly next to my university and the hospital and the school shared like a big lawn where we would play sports and, and all sorts of things there. So my day in college was I would wake up in the morning. I would walk to class. Then I would have some lunch. Then after lunch, I'd return to my room and put all my stuff down and walk over to the hospital for radiation treatment. And I did that all alone. Wow. And then after that was over, I'd come back to my dorm and I'd start throwing up in the bathroom and it was a public bathroom. And, and the good news mm -hmm. about if you're going to throw up in a, in a men's dorm as a freshman in college, you actually get like a cheering section. So people were like, yeah, <laughs> cool. you know, they thought I was like partying, right. Yeah. Of from radiation and they, you know, but people were like really excited for this. Then after I kind of recovered, I would I would study and I would I would repeat that the next day. And when I was at college, I didn't tell anybody. I told my boss and I told one of my friends, and that was it. I I did all this alone. I didn't want to stick out. So after this took place, it my treatments ended early in the summer, and I went back um, and and the doctor re-examined me and determined you no longer have cancer, which was which was wonderful. So I returned home and like, I think many folks who've had radiation, I was sleeping like 16 to 20 hours a day. Wow. Yeah. My parents were gradually waking me up earlier and earlier to try to build the stamina mm -hmm. to go back to school. Yeah. So I went back to school and 18 months later, I had a relapse this time. It came back um, in my back. It's a weird place for, uh, it wasn't in a lymph node. It was in, actually in my bone. Wow. So um, yeah, I had some back pain. And they decided, you know, after my history and recent experience, they decided to do a, a CT um, bio, or a CT scan guided needle biopsy. And I knew what I was getting in for this time. And I said to my mm -hmm. parents, if, if, if there's bad news, don't show up and do the whole dramatic thing. Just give me a call and we'll, and yeah, they gave me a call and, and that was it. Wow. And I think when you're, when you're facing the relapse like that, it really made me very angry. I, I had to leave college this time before I could at least stay and be among my peers and try to be normal. Mm -hmm. Now I had yeah. to drop out. And so I worked really hard and studied um, exceedingly hard, very um, mm -hmm. at the end of that semester, because if I died, I wanted somebody to see my transcript and say, this guy could have gotten a degree here. And so I studied so hard. I got a 4.0 uh -huh. on the way out. A lot of weird stuff happened in that five weeks. You know, at this point, the first time I, I went through treatment, it was on campus and no one knew. This time mm -hmm. I started to tell people that I was leaving. And so then just scores of strange reactions and hugs and cards and it was an outpouring. But then you leave. I left college. This was 1996. And this was pre-internet, pre-email, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. There was really no information or way to communicate. So yeah. I, again, found myself often alone. My parents worked during the day. 
And when I was recovering from chemo, I was by myself sitting in their home watching TV reruns and, and just praying that I could make it. And yeah. after eight months on July 31st, 1996, that that's when my doctor said, you no longer have evidence of disease and, and you made it, you, there's no more cancer. And I, it's been that way now. It'll be 28 years of summer. Wow. That's no more. Congratulations. Yeah. 28 years. That's amazing. But yet your story is incredible in so many ways. You know, it's been such a young age. And you know, I was 44 when I was diagnosed and I considered that really young as well. But I, I had a lot of yeah. my life behind me. I'd, you know, I had my, my home and my career and my family. And for you, it's such a young age. And you know, like, I know you said you didn't want to tell anybody, but it must be really hard as well. Because like you say, when you're at college, it's all about partying. It's about having fun. It's, yeah. it's a different yeah. life, isn't it? It's a different yeah. life than the life you were going through. And so even your family, I'm sure, you know, you, you must have felt very alone. I did. And survivorship. And one of the things, one of the things I want to tell other survivors is survivorship. When you have the structure of treatment and you re-enter the world, you have changed quite a bit, but yeah. the world hasn't. And people mm -hmm. see you as, you know, your pre-cancer self and you're starting, you're trying to figure out a lot of things as a new survivor from every time you get a cough or you feel a little sick, immediately you think it's back. Mm -hmm. Or that first time you go in for for scans, you're like, oh, crap, I know it's back. And here we are again. You know, yeah. just kind of like you feel like you're getting back into that that rut that you left. It's a it's mm -hmm. kind of a cruel reminder of where you were. Yeah. But I'm here to say that fortunately, those things start to um, get easier over time as a survivor you start to figure out what's important to you. And my advice is when you're going in for scans, my this this happened to me maybe two or three years after mm -hmm. I started going in, go in there to show them I don't have it anymore. I'm here to show you I don't have it. Not, oh man, you're going to tell me it's back. That's not the yeah. way to look at it. I'm here to tell you, you know, I'm done with this disease. Like, watch, yeah. look what I got here. I'm good. Yeah. And that made me feel a lot stronger, a lot better. It kind of took took the edge off of that. And, you know, over time, you start to relearn your body. You can feel mm -hmm. your circulation and, yeah. and you know the difference between a cold or something considerable. Yeah. And what really helped me, I think everybody who's gone through cancer can benefit from finding some kind of a passion. You know, what really gets you excited and, that, and mm -hmm. the, the what is different for everybody. It can be family, it can be an op, uh, it could be opportunities, career, whatever. Mm -hmm. But pour yourself into something that you really love. And so for me, in '96, when I when I was done, there was no resources or, or examples mm -hmm. of people who had done that. And then Lance Armstrong, the cyclist, was the one who really kind of impacted me a lot. You know, I saw him tearing up the Tour de France and. Um, and, you know, telling people, you know, saying cancer out loud and mm -hmm. like in your face and he was so brash. Yeah. That was a great example. Now, of course, Lance Armstrong, the doping and his yeah. disgrace. There's a, it's two sides of that coin, right? Long term, <laughs> it, did, it did work. But, yeah. but short, he was my guy. <laughs> and, yeah. and so I started doing, I started getting into health and like fitness. And I was, I started to um, climb I climbed Mount Rainier, which in the U.S., that's the highest point in the 50 states. It's in Seattle. Wow. And that was four weeks to the day after my treatment. I really wanted to even the score with cancer by doing that. And yeah. I started swimming, running, and just trying to get my body back into shape, you know, to mm -hmm. feel like prior to cancer. Um, and a lot, and it was less about like the objective or the, you know, the, 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 finish line or the top of the mountain or whatever and more about the process and just run it like if you do a long run or if you do anything that you have to concentrate for a long time it could be like knitting it could be mm -hmm. working walking anything yeah. painting writing while you're doing that your mind you can you can think about certain parts of that trauma and and start to just process that better i found that very therapeutic. So my advice to survivors is find your passion and then 
jump into it. Life is short. You don't know how long you're going to be around. So you might as well do something that you really love to do while you're here. That, that's very true. So true. And I love what you said as well about you taking control, because I think when you get that cancer diagnosis for a while, I was like that, like a rabbit in the headlights thinking I've got no control here. A doctor's telling me what I need, what I can do and what I can't do. Your life is, is it revolves around your hospital appointments and it's, all your control and all your choices are taken away from you. So for you to jump back in and say, right, I'm taking control now. I love what you said about the scans of going in with that attitude of, you know, come on then, you know, I'm ready for you. That whole mindset piece is so important. And I think, you know, as great as I'm, you know, I'm in the UK, our medical teams are fantastic. They don't deal with the the mindset or, you know, your, how you're feeling spiritually or how you're feeling about how your attitude is to life. It's very medical and they're amazing at that. But then the mind piece is so important. And that's what I struggled with a lot after my treatment. So what you're saying just really resonates with me. And I love the fact that you've got all this advice for people. So you've written a book, haven't you, about survivorship? Yeah, I have. It's called Better Dirty Than Done. And it's the story of um, my lowest week during cancer treatment. And also the cool things that I've done after cancer. Climbing mountains, running the Boston Marathon. Um, swimming from um, Alcatraz in San Francisco to the shore, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this book, not with the intention of publishing it or making it public, but I have a son who's going to be 20 at the end of February. And my goal was to write my best stories for him, you know, father to son. I wanted, I wanted him to take away, you know, I'm a big, a big fan of um, family history and I wanted him to have something of his dad. And so I wrote this book and my, my, like my, my plan was, I was going to print it in a manuscript and I did this and, and put it in my, my attic. So when something happened to me, he would come into the attic and find this manuscript, like a Holy grail and be like, wow, look at this. Now. I mean, in reality, he probably would throw it out and not realize what it was or, you know, <laughs> never be found or something. <laughs> yeah. so, so I told this I told this story to a friend and she said, that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. You should you've helped so many people just by yeah. talking to them and with your story, you should yeah. try to get this out there. And that's what I did. So it was published last fall and it's um it's out there. So that's that's where the book's at. And it's a book about resilience, it's a book about overcoming odds. Um, it's very emotional and um it's gotten some good reviews. So um yeah, it's that's yeah. the story. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I can't wait to read your book. But like I said before, it's a, it's a lot about the mindset and a lot, you know, something like a cancer diagnosis. So it can be any major event in your life. It can really break you or make you. I think that you, it's how you respond to it. It's not the event itself. You know, we can't control cancer. We can't control the outcome of that. But how you move forward afterwards for a while, it takes, like you say, you're not the same person that walked into that diagnosis. Yeah. That You've changed. You've changed so much and you've got to work out your new path. And for some people, I know they jump back straight back to their old life and they don't want to change mm -hmm. anything. They want to be exactly the way they were before. And that's fine for them. But so many people that I speak to are struggling, saying, I don't recognize myself anymore. I don't know who I am anymore. Things that... For me, I know my career was at one point really, really important to me. Then after my cancer diagnosis... Not so much, you know, and I realized, you know, for a long time that I'd not been living my life in the way that I wanted to. And it was an opportunity for me to make some changes. Like you say, none of us know how long we've got. So why not, you know, embrace that and, and try and get the best out of your life. And I love what you said about, you know, focusing on something. I, I've spoken to a lady yesterday who was doing pin art. I'd never heard of this thing before, like making yeah. pictures with pins. And she said when she's doing yeah. that, it takes her away from the horrible thoughts that are in her mind. She's still going through treatment. All of that is excellent advice. And mm -hmm. what, what happened to me after I, I beat cancer in the summer of 1996, I actually moved into the exact room that I was in <laughs> before, you know, when yeah. the room that I moved out of, I moved back into the, I mean, there are thousands of dorm rooms on the campus <laughs> and I had to pick the, like, just switch it up. You know, you, I think for anybody who's in that, in that phase, just hearing from others that you are different and the mm -hmm. world is the same, recognize yeah. that yeah. and, and try to try something, you know, that doesn't mean like, don't go back to your, 
job or, or go back to your obligations. It means recognize in yourself that you, you have changed and that maybe there are some other avenues or things that you should look into yeah. that might help you going forward, whatever that might be. And it's also not like a, a rush situation. Let it, let the journey unfold. Sometimes when you're mm -hmm. walking through the dark, you can only see the immediate path in front of you and that's okay. Yeah. Just let that let that yeah. illuminate and eventually over time you'll figure out oh this is what i was meant to do and yeah yeah i do love that one step at a time and that's what people sometimes worry about where am i going to be in a year's time where will it be in 10 years time well yeah. who knows for anybody where where you're going to be but one step at a time is really really good advice love that so rick i know we connected on instagram but where else if people want to get in touch with you where can they get in touch with you how can they contact you i'm on well, if you're if you're looking at my name <laughs> on, on my on the screen, you can find me on all you can find me on Twitter, on um, um, Threads, on Facebook at that at that right, um, okay. handle or rickjapleski.com is also uh, my website if you want to learn more about my story and see some pictures and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah that's, loved to, you love to, and I will. Uh, when we put the podcast out, there will be notes around here, and they'll be linked to your website as well, so people can learn out uh, more yeah. about you. But thank you so much for sharing your journey. I just think it, it's it, absolutely incredible. And and again, you know, the twenty eight years that that is amazing, yeah. and it's such a, a a beacon of inspiration. I think for people maybe that are not so far on, thinking, "How's my life going to be?" And some people feel almost like everything's taken away from them when they get that cancer diagnosis and the future can look really bleak. So it's great to speak to you. And I love the fact that you wrote this book for your son and, you know, that it's getting out there for other people to share as well. Yeah. So what, what does your son think of your book? Has he read it? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, at, at that age, there's very limited feedback, let's say, but it's been all positive. So he likes it. Oh, that's great. It's great yeah, to hear. Yeah. It's, it's heavy. You know, it's, it packs mm -hmm. an emotional punch. So, I mean, somebody who's yeah. 19, 20 years old, which is when he read it, it doesn't may, maybe have the uh, the repertoire to communicate that yet. But um, yeah. so far, it's been pretty positive. That's yeah. great. So good to speak <laughs> to you, Rick. Thank you so much. Thanks, okay. Gabby. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview that I did with Rick as much as I did. What an inspirational guy. And so many things that he said, you know, really give me food for thought. When you think about his um, amazing story, you know, he was only 19 when he was diagnosed, you know, at a time when he barely reached adulthood. You know, he was a child, really. He was at college. All his friends were doing college things, going out drinking and having a great time. And he was going through that cancer journey. What a difficult time. And as well for him in 1994, when he was diagnosed, there was very little social media. There was no way for him to connect with other people. But I just really want to say what I took away from his interview. Yes, he's very inspirational. And I know Rick does motivational speaking. And I, I bet that's uh, something good to hear as well. We only had a snippet today. It was a short podcast. But the main things I took away from what Rick had shared was, first of all, survivorship is difficult, we know. Um, but one of the things that he said that had really helped him was finding your purpose. And for him, you know, he's he's doing his speaking now, he's written his book, and his purpose is to help other survivors. Pretty much, you know, it's a very similar story to mine, really. But then what he also said was about finding your passion. And it doesn't matter what your passion is. Your passion could be absolutely anything that you like. It could be health and fitness. It could be nutrition. It could be whatever you like to do, whether it's reading, whether it's music, whatever it is that you're interested in. Whatever lights you up, do more of that. You know, we all know that our time on earth is limited, but sometimes it can take the shock of a cancer diagnosis to sort of make you stop and think, there's only so much time we've got. Do we really want to waste it worrying about things that don't matter and doing things that I don't want to do? And then the last thing he said about, you know, he found a role model. And we'll say any more about that. But he did find a role model. He found somebody who inspired him. And so I'd say to you, if you're on that journey, if you are lost after cancer treatment, find yourself a role model. Find somebody that you resonate with and find somebody that can help you. Because there are people that have trodden this path before. There are people like me who have made mistakes. 
But I know, I know now what those mistakes were, and that's my passion to help other people as well. So if you want to reach out to Rick, I'm going to put all the links to his social media, um, a link to his book as well, which I'm going to read. I haven't read it yet, but I'm really interested in reading what he has to say. I imagine it's quite a tough read, but I'm but inspirational as well. But there are people here to help you. You know, we have got the wonders of social media now. We've got the wonders of you listening to me or watching this podcast. Reach out to somebody. You don't have to suffer alone, my love. You're not alone. There are people here to help you. Anything I can do for you, you, as always, get in touch. Remember to stay safe and stay sane. And I'll speak to you very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.